So we've asked Chris and Paul to reflect on these things, and they're going to make um, uh, a couple of presentations, and then we hope to have a lot of time for your comments and questions. Um, so I'm going to we'll kick it kick it off with um, Chris, <clears throat> our neighbor in the Five Sisters. Great, thanks from around the corner. Um, uh, again, Chris Donnelly, I'm with the Champlain Housing Trust. I am I'm the director of community relations there, and I've uh, worked at CHT for almost 20 years. Uh, so it's been a, a little while. So I've seen a lot of uh, changes in the housing market, and but also a lot of things that so a lot of things that haven't changed. Um, just to give you a little snapshot, if you don't know about Champlain Housing Trust, um, we serve the three northwest counties of the state. We're an owner or manager of about 2,500 affordable apartments. We have a home ownership, um, affordable home ownership program. We steward about 675 homes through that to keep them permanently affordable. We have um, several loan fund programs um, that kind of fill the gaps that the market uh, or the uh, regular financial institutions don't fill. We provide a lot of education and counseling for people to buy a home or become more financial financial literate, literate or um, provide resident services for people in our housing. Um, and we own and manage a lot of um, community facilities such as the Old North End Community Center, some people might be familiar with. Um, we work with Paul, of course, on his, his properties. Um, uh, and we're an active real estate developer. We have five to 600 homes or apartments in development, and we're actively uh, working to uh, to build more. Uh, we've been around for about 40 years, uh, founded under the administration of uh, Mayor Bernie Sanders. Um, and we continue to try to fill where the gaps are in the, um, in the housing spectrum. Uh, anything from homelessness to home ownership, you know, for example, we, we uh, we help manage the pods uh, over on Elmwood Avenue. So that's just a brief kind of thumbnail sketch. Um, Tiff asked me in 17 minutes to describe how we got here to a housing crisis. And I used, I don't use the word crisis uh, lightly because, you know, it could be worse next year. And it's crisis seems like the highest level you want to be. I don't want to turn it up to uh, turn the dial up to 11, but I wanted to show you at least one chart that gives you um, an indication of over time um, how uh, um, how we've been seeing the housing market. So I'll just, I'm just not going to do a lot of this slides or data and so forth, uh, but I want to show you at least just this one uh, one little graph. So I'll share that. Um, assume you can all see that okay. Yeah. So um, we think about uh, the rental vacancy rate as being a healthy market where there's choice in the market for renters um, and it moderates the, the price in the market when it's about 5%. And if you see in this chart of the last 13, 14, 15 years, um, it hasn't even come close to 5% at the, at the top and just, just after uh, 2015, 2016, it got to about 3, 3.3%. But what this indicates is just the lack of options for people, lack of housing, the lack of um, uh, ability for the, the, the market to really work in what people think of as a market um, uh, satisfying the needs of people that are accessing it. And so it's just, it's just um, broken. I'm not sure how we get back up to a 5% level um, very quickly, but um, this just is an indication of, of how people are just having a, a struggle, um, just finding a, a decent place to live. Um, so um, there are a lot of reasons why, and I'll, I'll stop this. I can, we can share this through, through Tiff and, and Gabrielle uh, later. There are a, a lot of reasons why we got to this point, and you know, if I was doing this presentation or if I was talking to you 10 or 15 years ago, I would have to really kind of demonstrate that there's a housing crisis. And uh, but we all feel it. We all know it. That's why we're that's why we're here. Um, but, you know, um, in the last 20 years or so, 20, 30 years, um, 
we've seen the, the sizes of households getting smaller, even as more people are moving to the area. So there's um, fewer, uh, fewer people living per household, but more households um, trying to access, so access the, uh, the housing that we have. So we just haven't been building to maintain the fact that our household sizes are shrinking and, and yet more people are, are moving here. So that's one indicator. Um, more recently, we've seen um, an increase in short-term rentals. And so housing actually coming out of the market. Um, these are the Airbnb and that kind of thing. Uh, so housing coming out of the market, and I know Burlington has done a little bit um, to address this. So we've seen that kind of pressure in, in the market. Um, over Through the pandemic, there was, you know, what people thought of Vermont as kind of a paradise. We don't have like uh, great data on how many people moved to Vermont, I don't think, um, uh, over the last three, four years because of the pandemic. But we have seen an influx of people coming out of uh, from out of state into, into the region. So it's just a variety of factors that complicates why we're in this place where it doesn't seem like anyone can find um, a place to move to. Um, and Paul will talk about how that impacts people in the lowest uh, lowest incomes. But there's just been this whole kind of like, um, I, the, the term perfect storm is I think overused, but it does feel like there are lots of different um, forces that are all kind of creating this system that, that makes it difficult for people. Um, the, in the last year, there's been increase, increasing interest rates. So we went from three and a quarter percent in January, 2022, to seven, eight, nine percent, whether you're doing commercial lending or not, uh, by the end of the year. So even to build new housing has cost more, and so that slows things down. Um, the cost of materials and labor through the um, last few years, we know there's been a labor shortage. Materials have just gone through the roof too, and and so that's been a uh, uh, troubling. I don't know if Tiff said this before, but this is probably the depressing part of the conversation. Um, uh, or maybe Paul has more, more on this, but, uh, so there's just, a, there's a lot of factors that it's like, we're, we're pushing this, this rock up the hill. I will say, um, on a positive note though, the, the state, um, and the city have recognized this as a priority. And so we're doing things to, to address it. And, um, you know, the, um, the state has allocated a lot of resources in the last several years. Uh, to help build more housing, and a lot of it uh, being uh, for people of modest means, most of it um, between 110 and 140 million dollars. Each of the last three years has been allocated by the state through some federal sources. Um, that's huge investment. If we think back six years, that the state would have maybe been putting in 15 million. So it's almost 10 times the amount of investment into trying to get ahead and trying to address um, these, this um, kind of shortage of, of housing. So that's really, the, that money's starting to work through the system statewide. So that's great. I know, as I mentioned before, we're building as much as we can and as quickly as we can. Um, the state is also invested in providing services for people that need them. Um, and increase the base funding for the sub kind of supportive services, and also funded a, a program to make sure that there weren't so many people, I know we see it a lot, but uh, so many people um, uh, uh, living on the streets that might be if we weren't funding people for um, uh, motel rooms. Um, uh, so the state has been actually kind of really engaging in this as a, uh, as a priority and both Tiff and, and Gabrielle are involved with that. There have been some policy reforms that have been done that maybe have less of an impact in Burlington because we already are doing some of those things, but in some of the other surrounding communities, improving density, ability to do density, um, you know, building duplexes or fourplexes when there may be a single family home on a lot, that's really great. Um, Burlington is already doing some of that work. Um, there are some regulations for short-term rentals in Burlington. That's that's good progress. Um, and 
um, the city actually um, increased its its contribution to the the trust fund, which is paid for when people pay um, pay their property taxes. So there's a lot of uh, I think um, momentum or um, interest in in addressing this issue. I'm I'm hopeful that so it is does feel like a little bit of a pushing the, uh, the the ball up the hill or the rock up the hill, but um, I think we have the right um, the right kind of uh, uh, systems in place to help help address this. So I'll stop there. I just I could I could ramble all night, but I'll stop there and and let um, Paul jump in or Tiff. That's great. In. And and just one um, thank you very much, Chris. Um, I, I think that's kind of perfect overview. Um, you could go into lots of depth, but. Um, if people have questions, what we'd like to do is ask you to put them in a the chat um, <clears throat> so that we can see kind of where, what, uh, you know, as things are going, so we don't interrupt um, either Paul or, or Chris, um, <clears throat> so we can get them in the chat and then um, Gabrielle and I'll take a look at them and figure out kind of in what order to ask them. Thanks. All right, Paul Dragon. Okay, well, thank you. Thank you so much for having me. I will try to share my screen. If I have a, a presentation I can move through. I think it will keep us a bit focused, if that's okay with everybody. Um, so let me find where it is. And let me see if this works for you. Can folks see my screen? Yeah. Okay. Okay. Well, thanks again, everybody, for having me. And uh, I I concur with with Chris around uh, the housing stock, and you, you're going to see why as I, we kind of move through this uh, presentation. <clears throat> Again, I'm with CVOEO, uh, Champlain Valley Office of Economic Opportunity. We cover four counties. We also have statewide programs. Uh, we have, we've taken on two emergency shelters in the last two and a half years. Um, we do have a domestic and sexual violence shelter as well, and we operate a daytime shelter in Burlington, and we share services with CHT over at the Elmwood Pods, and we have an outreach team. So we're doing a lot of work around homelessness, um, and we also have a very large Head Start program, a weatherization program, a micro-business program, and several other interconnected programs. Um, we have 10 altogether. So I wanted to... Um, kind of walk through this because um, there's some key documents and I think it's important for us to have a historical perspective because when we're talking in the present, a lot of work has been done in the past. And um, we had a uh, study that was, um, let me just, I can't see it with this piece. We had a study that um, started in, uh, 2012, we had a Vermont Council to End Homelessness, and there was a report that they issued uh, the Vermont Plan to End Homelessness. That was back in 2012. In 2017, we had the Corporation for Supportive Housing out of Connecticut, uh, pretty renowned nationally, uh, do the Vermont Roadmap to End Homelessness, uh, and, and that was issued in January 2017. I encourage everybody to read that. It's going to reinforce some of the things that Chris said. And then in 2021, the corporation came back and they did another report strengthening the housing and service system. Um, so you can kind of see that there's been a lot of key documents, a lot of studies. In fact, the roadmap in 2017, when, that, when I was at the Agency of Human Services, that used 80 source documents and did a, a number of interviews around the state to get at that final report. Uh, then and now, if you look at the context for the report, um, I want to recall that in 2016, for the point in time count, that's a one night count, 
Uh, Vermont was lauded nationally for having a 20% reduction in the number of homeless people. Um, and we had a 25% reduction in chronic homelessness. And as you know, people are chronically homeless, meaning four times in one year or one year at uh, in, in length, um, in, total, in total length, at least one year. Those are high service users. So if you can get your folks who are chronically homeless housed, that saves the system a lot of money. So we did a really good job back in 2016. And I credit that 2012 report and some of the work that came out of the Vermont Council really helped to move the needle. And now you know that right now we have the second highest per capita rate of homelessness in the country, just behind California. So a lot of things contributed to that. Certainly the pandemic didn't help. Um, Certainly fentanyl use has not helped. Uh, certainly the reasons that Chris gave around housing stock, vacancy rate, all those things factor into this, but we have a very high rate of homelessness uh, in, in Vermont right now. I do want to acknowledge that during the pandemic, the state did a great job at sheltering people who are experiencing homelessness with a 98% shelter rate, which was really, really high. You can just see kind of uh, leading up to that 2012 report, if you look back at 2008, you got about a little over 2,200 people experiencing homelessness. That, that's again, one night during the year. And you can see it escalate up to 2012 where it hits uh, uh, 2,800. And you can see the something we never wanna see as shelter providers, the shelter stays rising during that time from 15 to 36 days, meaning people aren't able to access housing and they're even higher right now. We have people staying at our Samaritan house shelter for um, eight, nine, 10, 11 months. We had a guy stay there for over a year. So the shelters are really stressed in, in this state. Um, but you can, you see at, at 2012 and then it starts to go down towards 2016, where again, we had a very low rate of homelessness. And I say that because there is hope. I do think uh, we can get back there. I want to reference just a few strategies here, because again, we're going back over 10 years and some of these strategies um, still are needed. And I think what I'm trying to show you is a long history of a lot of interventions that we know work, but we haven't quite kept up the consistency and the resources needed to continue to bend that curve. We got close in 2016. Uh, so there's a lot of things we can do here. And I would just point out number six, addressing the benefit cliff. The TANF program, our reacher program has done a good job. A lot more can be done to make sure that people who are getting benefits, once they make money through work, we honor that so they don't lose their benefits and then become either marginally housed or worse, even homeless. Um, so a lot of these uh, strategies are, are, are still key and still in play. Um, then we go to the roadmap to end homelessness. It's a great document, uh, 2017. And we know it works. We have a great partnership. Um, CHD and CBOAO is a great example of a housing and a service partnership, but we have a lot of that throughout the state. I think we're really lucky there. And we have a very good uh, relationship with our state partners. And we were acknowledged in 2017 for being on the leading edge of ending homelessness in the country. The strengths of our current system is noted then, um, you know, the ability to focus on key populations. Remember, we drove chronic homelessness down by 25%. Those are folks that are hitting the emergency rooms, the court systems, high service utilizers, very expensive. Uh, if you can focus on that population, it drives your costs down. Really, really key for the future. We lost our focus there. Our partnerships, very important. Supportive housing is, is incredibly key, especially now where we're seeing so many people using substances, uh, so many people with co-occurring mental health and substance use conditions. And I will say, and I can cite examples, all through our shelter system, we have a high rate of people with intellectual disabilities, developmental disabilities, with chronic medical conditions. When we operated the Holiday Inn two years ago, we had five people in their 80s and up. Uh, our staff were changing diapers for senior uh, Vermonters. These folks should either be in higher levels of care, which I can talk about, 
or they need really dramatic uh, su intensive supportive housing when they do get homes. And we need to continue to focus on new in innovative programs. I'll shout out a couple. Family Supportive Housing, which is a state program where we have providers focusing on uh, uh, housing families who are experiencing homelessness with children and providing wraparound supports. We leverage federal Medicaid. So that means our costs were only about half and we were able to draw down federal Medicaid to expand that program. More can be done there. Very, very important. Um, so uh, you can see this from this report, a lot of these things still hold, right? Supportive housing is key because we are seeing so many people with high needs. Once we get them housed, we want to keep them housed. We need affordable housing. We need more housing. Rapid rehousing is a great tactic. We have a, a home program now at uh, CVOEO where we're rapidly rehousing families who are experiencing homelessness. We have 200 rapid rehousing vouchers. Even with the bottleneck that Chris talked about, the 1% vacancy rate, we've already housed 57 families statewide. That feels really good. And we'll get to 200. We need to make sure that the, the vouchers continue as the housing stock comes on. And again, homeless prevention, getting people services right now for a year, two years, whatever it takes to make sure they don't come back into homelessness because uh, we do not have... Um, a just cause eviction, right? People can be evicted for pretty much any reason. I'm not saying it's easy, but they can be evicted for um, for any reason. It doesn't doesn't have to be cited. So we do we are seeing a lot of people coming back into homelessness. Um, talked about some things moving forward. Uh, People may not know about the coordinated entry system. It was in its nascent stages then in 2017. It's pretty robust now. Uh, we, I, I think you should all know that the balance of state has one continuum, Chittenden County has the other. We get together monthly to coordinate services as best we can, and we try to be data oriented. We can do better with the data because data is the key to this. But I do want folks to know we have a system in place that can always be improved, but partners are connecting around this, this work. Um, the uh, financial investments were massive out of that 2017 plan. And you can see 33, uh, 331 million then, and then an ongoing uh, operating and service cost. Uh, so again, the question for us as Vermonters and for legislators and others is, you know, how do we want to utilize our money? Is this a worthy investment? If we don't do this, are we willing to see so many people out on the street, so many people in the emergency room, so many people with chronic health conditions that we're paying so much money for, or do we go upstream, take a public health approach, get more housing, more supportive housing online? These are cost avoidance strategies. They save the public so much money. We're never able to get beyond like, oh, this is the healthcare systems fund. This is the designated agencies and the mental health agencies fund. We're never able to get beyond that. We've got to get to a place if we really want to start to solve uh, homelessness where these systems of care are all in and they're connected and they're working together. Otherwise, we're gonna continue to spin our wheels. Recommendations, you can see uh, addressing the workforce needs. Like I said, you know, our staff at the Holiday Inn paid pretty darn good. There's 26 shelters in this state. Some of the shelter workers are making $15 to $20 an hour. I can go to Bur Burlington Bagel and make $25 an hour. Meanwhile, 30% of their population has a chronic medical condition or a mental health or substance use condition. They're doing work that should be done by licensed clinical social workers, nurses, and higher levels of care. That can't continue. We gotta have a cross-sector collaboration, as I said, and it means the Department of Mental Health, Disabilities, uh, Aging, and Independent Living, um, in our area on aging, and our substance use uh, ADAP, which is part of the Vermont Department of Health, all need to come together to make this work. Let's create an innovation hub. Right. Let's let's get the best people in the room. This is a long term commitment. There will be no short term fix to this many people homeless right now. This will take ongoing commitment. That's why I showed you the history there. However, we can do some innovation. So let's get some people together meeting regularly and start to innovate and do the best we can. Um, so some recommendations, we need more mental health and nursing supports integrated into our current homeless shelters. The problem we have now 
Chris is right. We don't have enough capacity. So we have so many people out on the street. You see it in Burlington, 275 people unsheltered, right? So um, when we do have our shelters, we need to make sure that we are having mental health and nursing supports in our shelters, in our emergency shelters. We have a healthcare equity project up in the Samaritan House where NCSS brings a mental health worker over once a week. That's worked well. We need more of that. Let's expand our CRT program, which is for people with um, severe and persistent mental illness through our designated agencies. However, we do know that not everybody wants to sign up for a designated agency. So there's a wonderful federal program called the PATH program. It's through SAMHSA. It's for outreach. It's um, no strings attached. It's for mental health workers to reach out on the street, bring people in, provide them support, and they don't have to sign up for the mental health agency because not everybody recognizes themselves as needing a mental health agency. Let's create a quasi-state program because there's not a, enough federal path funds for Vermont. We have no long-term substance use rehabilita rehabilitation facilities. Three weeks is the longest here. You can go to uh, New Hampshire and get six months. We need long-term substance use facilities. You know that. You know the high rate of overdoses now in Vermont. It's one of the highest in the country. Um, we, we need places for people to go and stay. And we know from the research that it takes a long time to rehab and three weeks is not enough. We need to increase uh, medical respite beds, UVM and CHC, uh, CHCB, the Community Health Center of Burlington have a small program. Let's do more of that. Uh, we operate the Community Resource Center where TIF, by the way, volunteers uh, regularly to provide meals. Outside of the center, we have six to eight people every day using I talk to our team, like, what are we doing? Oh, we go check on them. When they overdose, we narc in them. Meanwhile, we have a Head Start program, a huge Head Start program right across the street with kids and families. So I can't have our staff move those folks off of our community resource center property. I don't want them to go across the street. I don't want them to go anywhere else in our community. They're safer there. That's not the answer. That's not what a community does. We need an overdose prevention center. The governor vetoed it last year. Let's at least do a pilot. Let's get one in Burlington. Let's staff it. That way, our staff can point to a place and say, you can't do it here, but my gosh, you can get really good care over there, and you can do this safely, and we can check your drugs and make sure they're, they're, they're the best they can be. We need access to higher care beds. We just did a report. I was part of it. Community care homes, nursing homes have vacant beds all over the state. And they're independent, so they don't, they screen people out. And this report that was done showed, well, maybe we can get 40, 40 beds statewide. We need to do better than that, right? We, we can't have this disparity with people experiencing homelessness with chronic medical conditions in elderly people, 70s, 80s living in shelters or on the streets, when we have empty beds in community care homes and nursing homes, that's not right. We should, we should immediately be asking right away for four regional higher level of care emergency shelters. We run two. Um, I would love the designated agencies, medical facilities. Um, there should be four established at least regionally, could be done fairly quick. They can do medication management. They can have psychiatry on site. Um, they can get reimbursed for a lot of this and they can take 30 people off our hands that really deserve and need higher level of care. We can do more immediately this year, more capital investments in emergency shelters. We can rapidly purchase a hotel or two at least, get that innovation hub together, some realtors, some lawyers, do it, purchase them, get people safe, and then once we get the housing stock on, turn them into permanent housing. We need safe camping and parking sites. Super controversial. I don't, I don't, I don't, I kind of don't get it because we've got people in Burlington at the Congregational Church right now, 20, 25, 30 people camping up right around there. And we see what happens. And then they get scattered all over the place. So at least if we know. We're not moving people from site to site. We can find them. We can provide services. Let's think about mobile homes as affordable housing. Um, and let's think about mobile home parks as resident owned. Again, we got to keep up with the rapid rehousing. We've got to really, along with chronic homelessness, I think a focus should be on 
uh, of really solving child homelessness because we know from the research, if you're homeless as a child, you're more likely to be homeless as an adult. So let's move upstream. We've got about 450 families statewide who are homeless. We can solve family homelessness and make sure we're preventing future homelessness. So that is my, that's it. I'm going to stop the share. You are so fast. <laughs> Breeze through sure. all of that. Thank you so much. Um, I, Chris, do you have anything that you want to add in terms of um, policy recommendations um, or or recommendations for action? <clears throat> um, uh, I would never contradict anything Paul says. <laughs> Paul is just is very comprehensive and in terms of what he said, you know, there was um, there was an article. I mean, I just thinking uh, something simple. Um, you know, there was an article um, yesterday, the day before, in the New York Times that talked about a woman in Washington State who was earning seventy five thousand dollars and living in her car, and she was um, staying in a parking lot that was an authorized parking lot that you know a number of people were staying in, and, and a number of people, a number of states have or areas have have done this to authorize, here's a place that you can come and be in safe. And that was one of the things that Paul had in his recommendation. Um, it's it's a it's a stopgap. I don't even want to call it a band-aid. You know, it's it's less than that. But um, you know, there are ways in which we can at least pull people together in one place um, and provide some services for them. And you know, we're trying to do that at the the emergency shelter on um, Elmwood Avenue. Um, but I also think that we should start thinking about parking lots as places that we should build housing. And that's going to take a lot of um, people uh, thinking about what their communities want to um, look like, uh, realizing that there's density that will um, help build more housing more quickly and serve a range of needs and services. Um, but we may lose a view of the lake. And that may be something that we need to um, think about in terms of um, our own our own values. But, um, you know, do you want people sleeping in their cars in a parking lot or do you want some housing, housing there? So, um, um, you know, immediate things that people can do is, is um, you know, advocate with their, uh, not your local legislators are fine, don't bother them. Um, but uh, your city council and, and the mayor's office that you're there to um, say you want more housing, bill, you want more permanent housing. But in the meantime, we need to do some of these other things. And then one last thing, Paul talked a lot about um, substance use and some of the things that we see very visibly in our in our community. And um, he he talked about this too. And it's really we need. Um, I think a health response, a health system response first. It's not a housing problem for a lot of these folks. We can't put, we can't create housing and then all of a sudden put yeah, these right. uh, this folks in need into them. We need to have a health response that goes along with it. Um, and so we all can't take that on. My shop can't take, take on those needs. We need to have other types of services involved. Um, so that's the other thing that I, I really think that we need to hear more voices calling for. It's a community safety, it's community response. Um, uh, but it's really it's it's really making sure people are healthy. Well, <clears throat> okay. Thank you. Here we are. <laughs> You've laid it out. There are a whole lot of questions. I don't know, Gabrielle, does something kind of jump out to you as a starting point for, for the questions? Well, uh, thank you, Chris, for answering some of the questions uh, directly. Um, I think that I think the one uh, the one of the ones that comes up is okay so we understand the need for um you know the mental health as well as the housing and 
and the fact that we need to really work within the existing systems and and build upon them and really working with partnerships and then it's not just about housing it's about services um but i think one of the questions that kind of builds off of that is um uh so what do we do right now um <laughs> you know some of the some of the immediate solutions um in particular paul that you were describing um I, what i was interpreting was so legislature keep putting money to it um but you know nancy had asked so what do we have to do to get moving on these immediate solutions that are being described um you know how do we it, it took us a long time to get here um it's been decades that we have not been investing in you know middle range housing um and also affordable housing uh let alone the social services uh mental health um and uh drug use issues so those are all there but it's also taken us decades to get to where we are in terms of just not having enough stock how do we address that given that a lot of those pieces take time And she wrote it while you were talking, Paul. So I'm gonna I'm gonna tag you. <laughs> what are the immediate solutions? Yeah, I um, I I do want to reinforce um, that this isn't an impossible situation. It is going to take a few years of dedicated effort. And I'm going to point to the Vermont Council of Homelessness that was a governor appointed and then went away, and they were able to keep the pressure on in the data and we have better data than we've ever had right now. So I would, I would, and we also did away with the child poverty council. So I think those two things coming back where people can hold the short-term work, the medium-term work and the long long-term work is gonna be really important because you gotta understand the data. People do understand when you say, um, you spent X millions of dollars on emergency room visits for people who have been chronically homelessness. What are we doing? Um, people get that. So I think for me, um, right right now, we're falling very far behind the curve. So, you know, for me, it's like asking the state, well, we did, um, it's unpalatable, but <laughs> we did shelter 98% of unsheltered people just recently, and we did it with federal dollars. So I think we're going to have to figure out how we can at least get back to something close to that, because we have too many people living outside unsheltered. So I would call for the rapid building or repurposing of buildings or hotels for at least nighttime shelters and some daytime services the place where we need to get with our shelter system is to make them look more like housing because people will not recuperate and move out of them quick enough if they're in mass shelters that don't look good and that's part of the problem with the hotels but right now what we have to do is look at how we can best shelter people and I think take the highest care needs people and look at those four regional shelters for this year, only 30 beds each. I say only, I know it's a lot of work and ask for other systems of care to get involved. Why can't they? They're serving these people anyway. They can get reimbursed. Our shelter system can't be reimbursed for anything. We have to fight for every grant. Most of our funding is one time. Even we just took on the Champlain Inn. I was told this is one year funding. You know how hard it is to hire somebody for a year? And you got to tell people. So uh, I would say we get moving on that sooner rather than later. And we start looking at um, other ways to um, get some rooms going for the so many people that that July 1st <clears throat> um, exit really hurt, really, really. And you can see it in Burlington if any of you walked around Burlington. Can I ask the two of you to um, <clears throat> comment on Nancy Harkins says, you know, like, um, it sounds like we have capacity um, in terms of supportive care. Um, do you agree with that? 
I mean, I, I see. Many, yeah. I mean, it, I, it comes in the hotels, it's it's almost. In, no, it, capacity for service, you know, oh. supported housing services, um, because I think that there is, I mean, everybody, um, yeah, everybody recognizes the need for supportive services. And yet, what is the capacity yeah. to provide them? So if you can't tell, I'm from Providence by my accent. I go back to Providence and I see around the country a lot of municipalities stepping up. They they run shelters and they hire people. So I know for CVOEO, we just took on two um, two shelters. We're not a we're not able to take on any more. I'm not sure the other providers around the state. I suspect you would get some other providers that have a little bit more capacity, but why won't some some of the municipalities step up and do some of this work? This is a community problem. It needs an all-in state, town, city, provider, federal solution. So I do wonder why some of that isn't happening. And I do wonder why um, developmental disability organizations, why the mental health system why the substance use system in the medical system aren't doing more, quite honestly. So that's where well, you some, can find your capacity. Some of it, Paul, I think uh, you alluded to before, you can make 25 bucks an hour making a bagel sandwich. And, um, you know, the, the, there are, um, there have been investments made to the state funded social services programs over the past few years to the tune of eight, nine percent a year for the last couple of years, but it's still not enough. And so until we pay people to do the work that we care about, and I don't know if you want to talk about teachers or nurses or whatever, any, the people that are caring for our communities need to get paid for the work that we value. And um, you know, you get on the soapbox here, but um uh, so that's that's one of the, the the shortcomings in the system. The other thing that's happening, and I, I don't want to this up, it's been gone in and out of my head twice now, is that we need to also invest in those uh, those programs that prevent people from becoming homeless in the first place. And those are cheaper. You know, those are things that we can do. They're back rent programs. On the side of his shop or other organizations can do this. They just help people get over the hump of my car broke down and I can't get to work. And it's a month or two or what have you. They're not really systemic problems. They're just poverty. And um, if we can help people there, then we then we can focus on the people that are more chronically in need, um, whether it's health or housing or what have you. And so we 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 have an opportunity to think about that now because there's so much of a focus on it. but. There's so much focus on the on the crisis that we're not looking at some of the easier um, uh, apples to pick off your tree, you know. So, yeah, I uh, with regards to poverty, um, I just finished reading the book Poverty by America, and he does a back of the envelope calculation. But you know, if you Google how much the one percent evades in taxes, it's 163 billion annually which is more than enough um, if if the policy decision was to take all of that money to lift everyone up and above the poverty line, that would have to be a, a policy decision. But there, you know, if we simply um, required law that is currently required in terms of taxes, we would have the funds for that. Um, but it, it, yeah, it, this is to provide those services, and it's much easier to go make a, a bagel for sure. Uh, if we had asked folks to put questions um, in the chat, but we have a raised hand, I don't know if there's. Hi, if you don't mind, I was just going to um step in for one second um paul and i go back a long ways i i worked for many many years in the developmental disability system and i've been doing training since i retired from the state 
Um, and this past year, I actually trained staff at the Howard Center. Um, I trained about 150 staff who provide developmental disability services. A large proportion of those people were new, just since newly hired since the pandemic. And um, one thing that was really remarkable to me, talking to many of those folks, Howard Center is the designated agency for Chittenden County, is that I would say a good half of those people working there can't afford to actually live in Chittenden County. Um, I talked to people who live... At, they're up in St. Albans now. They're up in Fairfield and Belvedere. And I mean, it's just crazy um, because they're working and, you know, and they are making a little, they're making more than minimum wage and they're making a little bit, um, you know, more than they were a few years ago, but they still, they cannot afford to live in the community um, that they, that they work in. I mean, it were just so out of whack in terms of wages and the affordability of, um, of living, uh, being able to live in your community. Thanks, Amy. Um, I'm, I'm going to bring up another question. There, there's a question here that says, uh, I heard that there are open mental health beds that aren't filled. Is that true? I ask that because I've heard that there aren't. And yet, Paul, I thought you said earlier that there were 40 beds um, available through a separate care system. Well, a Amy would know this too. There's a community care home system throughout Vermont and nursing homes and nursing homes are the highest level. And what we had asked was that the state kind of look at where there are empty beds and there are, and a report was just issued. And they said, well, we could probably get maybe 40 beds statewide out of this. And I thought that was not, it's better, but it's, it, I think there's more opportunities there. I think what um, I, you know, I think Meg makes a great point, and we should ask um, the association uh, that runs the 12 mental health agencies how many beds there are, because I don't know, but I have heard there are empty beds, and I suspect some of it is, um, again, people have to apply, and it's not easy to go through the application process to sign up at a designated agency especially if you're somebody who might be paranoid, it's schizophrenic or have law enforcement issues. So how do we remove those barriers and make sure, that's why I mentioned the PATH program and make sure people can get into these beds, um, maybe without signing up and then being engaged. But I, it would be, it's a great question. And I think we should all find out. You know, I'm wondering, um, and I, I I invite anybody to respond to this, but I am wondering if uh, the legislature or policymakers, city, you know, min municipal or state um, have blind spots that um, we that need to be um, made very explicit. Are there things that we refuse to see that? <clears throat> um, that you need us to see? What are we most resistant to? Um, well, you can think on that. <laughs> I, I think um, what's never been cracked is the idea that all these different systems, and albeit they have data, different data systems, different funding sources, are not able to come together around homelessness. And we rely on a very underfunded shelter system and a staff that's underpaid yet seeing extremely high levels of need in their population. I am not sure why that's happening and why there isn't more uh, force <laughs> or a push to bring those systems together. I was a, I was in the agency. I was the deputy secretary. I'm not saying I had any, you know, I was able to do it either. It's just, it would take legislative action to really make this happen. I, I, um, I just want to channel, maybe this is a, this is a much larger conversation, but I want to channel a former Ward 5 um, constituent, Richard Kemp, who lived down in Flint Avenue. 
And uh, he used to always say, there's plenty of resources out there to do all the things we need to do. It's just about how we need to redistribute them. And so thinking about the tax structure of the state, you know, there's more we can do federally, I'm sure. But, you know, there was another article in the Times today that talked about the the net worth of people going up 37% over the last three years in the pandemic. I think there are plenty of resources in this country to address this really kind of big issue that we're facing. I think it's just going to take some um, some courage uh, up and down the the power structures that be to, to make it happen. But that's my, my big picture. There's a question in here <clears throat> um, about um, well, ac actually, uh, Marissa, would you like to 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 tell us a little bit about your experience and um, <clears throat> and what you would like to see happen? You you wrote something in the chat about um, mental health and substance use um, crises. Yeah, sure. So. Um... I actually worked for Howard Center Developmental Services for six years, and now I work for Burlington Housing Authority um, re Retention Department. Um, I, I specifically support the folks who live in our properties, but we have a sector that helps BHA voucher holders. Um, and Tip, I think I actually saw you at a, a housing con uh, a conference, and I wouldn't stop talking because when you told me you were a rep, I was like, these are all my thoughts. Mm -hmm. um, so I feel like we have... Uh, maybe cross paths. Um, but yeah, so I have helped um, actually DS clients who are struggling with um, mental health crises, who also have comorbid um, substance use issues, and um, they are not able to get into our treatment facilities because they will kind of point to the opposite issue saying, we can't serve this person because they have mental health um, disorders that are causing this behavior, not the substance use. And then you go to the substance use facility and they say the exact opposite. So I, I supported, um, before I left, I was supporting someone for over a year and a half who was chronically homeless. Um, and I couldn't even get him into treatment centers when I could get him um, open to accepting this. I couldn't even get him into places because they would point fingers at the other um, facility saying he has to go here first and then he wouldn't be admitted. Um, it's just really, it's, it's as a service provider, it's really discouraging when you work day in and day out, terrified that you're going to get a phone call that this person has passed away because they're homeless and not receiving the support they need. And then when they finally agree to go somewhere and get the help that they so desperately need, the doors are closed and locked. Um, and and it, we shouldn't have to have people need service providers screaming at these agencies to let these people get help. It should be an open door policy and say, hey, we're here and ready to help you when you're ready to get help. But that is not the case in my experience. And Paul, does that square with your um, experience? Uh, I was just thinking of what Marissa said. In 2008, we had a two-year SAMHSA grant from the federal government to work with all the designated agencies on co-occurring treatment. And we'd go in and monitor them and train in how to be competent for co-occurring care so that very thing that Marissa said does not happen because a lot of the DAs are broken out into mental health and substance use. So we worked hard to bring them together um, as best we could. and. It sounds like that's still not really working. That's really unfortunate. There, we, I mean, 50% of the people with a mental health issue have a co-occurring substance yeah. use condition. Well, and, uh, you know, the, the mobile crisis, ex the, the expansion of mobile crisis um, teams throughout the state um, is <clears throat> at least designed to address co-occurring um, issues. And yeah. so people will be cross-trained. Um and they're, you know, I, that's <clears throat> funded through a bunch of federal money and a bunch of money from the general fund that we um, put in this last year to start that up. 
Um, I think what, oh, sorry. I think Marissa, mm -hmm. she can clarify. She might have been referring to like inpatient and outpatient programs as well, though. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so, that's correct. Yeah. yeah. Okay. <clears throat> um, uh, Paul and Chris, I, this is a, as a policymaker, this is housing is not my expertise, but I do often look to other states with similar populations uh, to get a sense of, you know, what might be working there um, that we could lift for here. Are you seeing other states with similar demographics and size and sort of rural makeup like Vermont um, that are doing anything uniquely um, imaginative and creative that we could emulate? Um, I will start this, but I may punt to, to Tiff because she's had conversations with people in Maine that have um, established some um, ongoing funding sources for uh, so social social services for people in housing and, and investing in a housing first model uh, as well. But she may have more I, I think direct what, knowledge. Of that. Well, what I learned from Maine, I, I'm working with um, the chairs of appropriations, um, House General and um, uh, Human Services, and um, the speaker on a housing bill, trying to shape the contours of the housing bill. And um, <clears throat> I used to serve on um, House General. Um, uh, which which handles at least the physical infrastructure of housing um, and its development. Um, and <clears throat> so the the biggest difference, I think, between our state and Maine is that this year they committed a portion of the property transfer tax to funding services. So <clears throat> organizations like Paul's, don't have one year contracts. <laughs> they know that there is a consistent funding source that will support the kind of um, services that <clears throat> that have to be provided to many people who are in supportive housing. And um, <clears throat> that's a big commitment. And one of the things I have heard over and over again from service providers with whom I've spoken is, we, we, you know, you can't give me a one-year contract and expect me to be able to hire people who are going to want to stay uh, for any length of time. This is very hard work, um, and they need a little more security than that. And, um, <clears throat> and you know, we can't live year to year for um, in not knowing kind of to what degree housing services will be funded. Um, and so, um, so. It, <clears throat> I think there is some real receptivity to that idea. And um, next week or week, the week after, we'll be talking with um, the head of Ways and Means about the ideas that she has um, to develop funding um, that can support not just construction, but also the service side of things. Um, I, I think that <clears throat> Maine has committed itself to a, a state and um, uh, uh, kind of local um, mix of housing uh, supports, um, housing navigators at the state level that are not fun, you know, not temporary, but full time and um, really have a sense of where everybody is and <clears throat> what they may be missing um, out on so that they can support the agencies that are providing the day to day support. So. Um, I think that's probably one of the most important pieces of work that we could do. I think just to say, I because it's I know um, uh, time, there are got probably going to be three different types of housing bills. One is going to relate to zoning, and a number of you have brought that up. And Gabrielle serves on the committee um, that would be reviewing um, proposals and um and did last year when they made some some changes um in um zoning and permitting second <clears throat> will be kind of housing construction and then third will be uh the emergency services um and emergency housing um for folks who are unhoused um and i i, I have a feeling that those <clears throat> will be in three 
different bills that will all show up in the budget um, uh, uh, or parts of them will show up in the budget, but they're um, I, there. So there are different people who are working on different aspects of, of the issue. And I, <clears throat> I would really welcome your thoughts, further thoughts about um, a number of you have already shown that you have a, uh, not just an interest, but expertise in certain areas um, that, and, and that could be very helpful to our group. Um, and I would welcome a conversation with you or an email from you um, with your further thoughts. <clears throat> yeah, um, we had scheduled this to 745. Um, we also recognize it's a Wednesday night and um, you know, if folks wanted to end earlier, we could. Uh, so you guys could populate. I, I also don't want to cut off the conversation if, if folks are wanting to stay on. So feel free to type into the chat if you'd like to go till 745. I, I did want to ask, Chris, there was a specific question about now that Brayburn Apartments in South Burlington is renovated and set up, is there another similar project for CHT in Chittenden County? And thoughts on replicating the pods model in other parts of the county and the state? Yeah, thanks. And I know I just saw Paul uh, put in uh, that Oregon had, uh, uh, during the pandemic, had rapidly purchased a bunch of motels and used for temporary, then permanent housing. And that's similar to what we've done in Vermont. We did a, a lot of this in Vermont. Um, so when uh, people were talking about the Oregon model of, of uh, doing this, I bristled a little bit because I think we've, we've done a lot of it too. Um, we don't have another motel um uh lined up to do this type of thing we're always open because as um as we've learned we've done we've purchased 10 motels for a variety of purposes um uh it's cheaper it's faster and it gets people housed um in a much smoother way so we're always open to that so i know we have um, we always um, take calls from our brokers on, on uh, people looking for that. Um, uh, and then the pods, I haven't, I've heard from a couple other places around the state that are wondering how it's going. It's still early. So I think we're still assessing. And I'm not sure there's a plan to replicate that. Um, but the city of Burlington really stepped forward and said they wanted um, this to happen and uh, put forth their their resources for it. And so I think it's it's working uh, relatively smoothly. Um, and, uh, but the people are staying there longer than we anticipated because there's no place for them to move to. Um, so really the answer is finding permanent housing. Um, you know, we need to do these stop gaps in the meantime, but um, uh, the, the answer is really trying to to find a real um, a real place for them to live. Mm -hmm. Somebody asked in the in the chat about um, our Gabrielle's and my support um, for the um, <clears throat> uh, safe um, uh, safe use facilities. I'm <laughs> I've lost the name. Um, but it's it's basically there's a bill in that's currently pending in my committee. It just didn't um, get out um, before the end of the session um, that would have supported um, safe injection sites. And that is something that I personally support. Um, and I believe that our committee is going to take it up um, pretty immediately um, and get it out so that um, that process can begin. Um, and we'll see where the governor is on that. Um, I, I think we kind of know. Um, and so that may that may be require another override. Um, <clears throat> and I'm I'm going to say that I have not looked at the bill that uh, Tiff is referencing. So I would want to look at it because I typically look at the bills before I uh, comment. Um, one, you know, I I I don't know a ton about um, the pros and cons 
of uh, overdose prevention centers. Um, the, when I've asked people uh, who know more about it, the, the primary con or one of the ones that was raised was more so when they're located in um, not places like Burlington, but more rural areas uh, and what it means for uh, transportation for people to get to them, to get back from them. Um, so how how those centers are designed statewide, but specific to, uh, you know, each community um, is thing that is as an area that needs fleshing out. I am <clears throat> Gabriel. I, this is a good way maybe to to end <clears throat> this. Is what can we as Vermont residents do aside from voting to support um, all these efforts? Um, I, I think <clears throat> for one thing, I think that Paul needs volunteers. So, uh, you know, uh, volunteer um, uh, where um, you can, if you can. I also think, and I'm gonna be political here, but I believe that the administration needs to hear from Vermont, more Vermonters that, that what we are doing isn't enough because we met a lot of resistance um, from the administration last year um, to extend the motel program, um, to invest in permanently affordable housing. Um, and and <clears throat> unless the administration feels pressure, it's all on the legislature to try to respond. Um, and you know, we can't do this alone. Um, and we, I think, could be probably very, um, I think we could be uh, uh, better at asking for help um, uh, in the coming months because we're, we're going to need it. And um, and <clears throat> and I, I think, too, it's really important if you hear about an interesting model, if you, if, you know, uh, communicate those, share those with not just us, but Paul, Chris, others that you know in the community who are involved in this, because it it is we all share responsibility for the solution and um, and for committing our energies and resources to addressing it. Yeah, and for a very near term action, um, Tiff, I don't, I, you know, feel free to call or email the governor and say, could you know, could you please support getting the opiate funds out the door? Because they're not out the door yet, right? Nope, they're not yet. I think, I think we appropriated that, that like when. Well, I, I think some of them. I mean, it's it's been. It, there are some um, RFPs that are going to come online pretty soon. What, whether they needed an RFP or not is unclear, but it, it is. I do think some of the money that we're going to see. Um, <clears throat> I think that, um, frankly, I think that our state agencies and departments have been cut to the bone <clears throat> and their ability to turn money around really fast has been really compromised by successive administrations that have made critical cuts to especially the Agency of Human Services. And so when we talk about raising the Medicaid reimbursement rate, when we talk about state workers <clears throat> um, and, you know, I, I expect a lot of people who work for the state because, you know, people trust us to do the right thing and to work as hard as we can. And I know a lot of people are working as hard as they can um, in, in these various agencies and departments, and <clears throat> we're expecting too much. So, so that's another way to push back at a governor who said to all departments, 3% raise <clears throat> is tops. You know, in your budget proposals, I don't wanna see anything more than 3% um, increase. Um, so um, <clears throat> I, I just think that I don't believe that the governor hears that much from people. Um, and I think we've got to get better at communicating as citizens um, with the administration. 
and oh. and I also just think there is a sense that um, uh, the governor did a good job um, through COVID, and uh, he is you know a generally reasonable um, individual. Um, personally, I am really seeking more vision uh, and more of a proactive view of what we can see from Vermont, um, if it's for housing or for its mental health supports or uh, opiate treatment. And I, I also just think this is this is not uh, related to the to our current governor, but um, fundamentally there is you know a different viewpoint in terms of what the role of government should be um, and how big it should be. And uh, right now we have a general manager and a CEO who, um, you know, does not necessarily feel like uh, government is as needed as perhaps I do. I, I really do feel like government is needed for, for the things that the for-profit world won't address. So, but enough for being political. <laughs> Um, you know, in our little Zoom cafes in future months, we'll keep you and and through French Porch Forum, we will um, keep you abreast of what's happening, um, the conversations that are happening. Um, I uh, I I really can't thank Paul or Chris enough for the work that they do. Um, thank it's, you. It's critical, and you are you know um, kind of two of my heroes. So, and I really appreciate your coming tonight. And to those of you who work in this area, it is hard work. So thank you. Well, thanks, everybody. Um, we'll put a link to the recording um, uh, for everybody who wasn't able to come, but um, we really appreciate your coming tonight. Great to see everybody. Thank you all. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Okay, thanks, everybody.